just did his other job and um, he fell short of me.
Morning, everybody. I just want to make a quick announcement, too, if, if you aren't already aware. 97.1 is the radio station. If you're having trouble hearing at all, 97.1. There are also spots, um, if you're wanting to just hear from your car, you can still come up closer if you need to. Um, you can park along the sidewalk here. There's also uh, three or four close parking spots if you're needing to hear any better, but 97.1 as well. But be mindful of your car battery. Uh, most car batteries should be able to go at least two hours on a, on a good charge, but I, I don't take my word for it completely. So. We have <laughs> so also um, a couple announcements before we get uh, begin here. My name is Pastor Luke Johnston. I'm here at St. Luke Joy, and we warmly welcome you if you are visiting us uh, today. Thank you for praying uh, to keep the rain off of us, but we are prepared. If, if it does start to rain, we can just tuck ourselves inside, and we have some trash bags ready to go, so we should be just fine. But thank you for your prayers, and it's wonderful to have the rain, the weather, the birds. I don't know if you've been able to hear some of the recordings, but the birds sing along quite loudly with us, which is a beautiful thing. So we're just so thankful to be in the presence of God. And I was just thinking about um, this week about how thankful I am to be a pastor, and not only to this church, but during this time, because when the stocks are down, literally and physically, uh, that's when the church has the opportunity to shine the brightest. Amen. We're called to be a light in a dark world. And so we have the opportunity as a church during this time to shine our light for the whole world. You know, it's for the world to look at us and go, man, what is up with those Christians? Why are they so joyful when it seems to be like so much chaos is around the world? Well, it's because we have the ultimate hope that is Christ Jesus, our Lord, who we can hold on to, look to, and be anchored in until eternity. Because he said those wonderful words to us, behold, I am with you until the end of the age. So with that being said, um, it's also a reminder, our session met, um, hopefully you've been able to get a second letter from the session, just in communication. Um, the, also, our May Joyful Journal has gone out, so if you don't have that in email or mail, it will get to you by mail as well, and there's several great articles in there we'd love for you to read from all different kinds of members and session members and leadership at the church. And then also, we most likely will be doing drive-in church like this until at least the beginning of June. So we're most likely going to be doing this for the rest of this month of May, um, just to be on the safe side, to watch what happens with the numbers, and also just to be protecting of our congregation. So you can most likely expect us to start up in some format in June if all things do continue to go downhill and we see uh, improvement. With that being said, if you're following along as well, um, uh, we have, do we have any, some, any bulletins? If, 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 I don't know if we haven't, we do have a few. So if you're needing um, a physical bulletin, if you want to risk having our germs touch yours, we do have physical bulletins, but also it is online through the church email. If you got that, you can follow along as well. But we're going to be reading our call to worship. It's from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5 through 6. Nehemiah was one of the uh, builders who returned from Babylon after the exile. And God was now rebuilding his people in Israel. And they opened up the law, the good law, the law they loved, and they read it together. And these are the words from Nehemiah 8. Hear the call to worship. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them as he opened it. The people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hear the word of the Lord. We're going to sing a song called Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. Let's sing it out. There's nothing worth more than a level. 
Thank you for being here, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your love. Lord Jesus, we do pray that your Holy Spirit 
would be here with us. Lord, we, we want the Holy Spirit and Christ and him crucified, Lord, and your cross to be dead center of everything we do. Lord Jesus, may your name be praised and lifted high. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we're going to um, read the Nicene Creed together. Um, it's a wonderful creed that came together. It has the essentials of truly what we believe in a, in a well-articulated way. And it's so important for us to proclaim truth. Proclaim it because it is directly from Scripture's direct revelation from our Lord. So let's read the Nicene Creed. It's a little bit, little bit long, but it's worth reading. It's worth proclaiming. Let's say it together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again. According to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets, we believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. Praise be to God. Hear now the call to confess sin from Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. At this time, let's take this opportunity to silently confess our sins together to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do confess, Lord, of our many sins, not only individually, but as a church, God. We confess, Lord, our pride and our longing to lean on our own understanding. Lord Jesus, forgive us of this. Lord, forgive us of trying to do things before we seek you outside of your counsel. Lord God, we want to do everything in accordance to your will, Lord, but we know we make mistakes and we are sinners, and for that we repent, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your mercy, God, that we can boldly come before your throne through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we are forgiven. Amen. Hear the assurance of pardon from 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. 
believe it, heavenly, believe it, uh, beloved, that the heavenly Father has forgiven us and that therefore we can have new life. Now let's sing this wonderful hymn together of truth, trust and obey. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we glorify you. Lord Jesus, we long for your will to be done, Lord, as you told us to make disciples, teaching everything you have commanded us, going into all the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, through the will of the Father, and we pray, Lord, that today, someone here, Lord, who does not know you will hear your voice for the first time. Lord Jesus, we pray that your will will be done, Lord, for the sheep that you were calling right here in this pasture, in this parking lot. Lord God, we pray for this community, for here in Kansas City North, Lord, for all that is beyond, Lord, here in the Northland, we pray that your Holy Spirit would sweep through, Lord Jesus. We pray for each church, that is proclaiming your name, reading your word this morning, that you would bless them, Father. Lord Jesus, we ask for revival. We wanna see revival come, Lord, to our people, to our country, to this community, to this neighborhood, Lord. Even if it's Lord, we, revival in the hearts of one or two, Lord, we know that you are at work and we wanna join you where you are at work. Lord God, we know that all things that you do, Lord, in our lives. They work together for those who love you, Lord, and we do love you and we trust you. Lord Jesus, help us to have faith. Help us with our lack of faith. Help us in our obedience, Lord God. We wanna pursue holiness. We wanna be after the things that you love. We wanna be after the fruits of the spirit, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you would shake up each and every person here, Lord. Every person watching online, every person, Lord, who can hear this radio, every person sitting in their car, Lord Jesus, may this be the day that they say there's no going back, that they will commit their lives wholly and fully to you, putting you in front of all things. 
Lord God, we want this to be the day that we continue to renew our covenant with you, Lord, that we are your people, a new covenant people, sanctified by your glorious fire and by the water of baptism, Lord. We go into the new world as a new people with allegiance to Jesus Christ and him crucified. Lord God, we want that to be our message to the end of our days, that Jesus was crucified and has risen, and therefore there is hope, there is There is reason to believe and there is new life. We can be made new, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for that. We thank you for what you did on the cross. And Lord God, we pray for our congregation today, Lord, for those that are struggling, those that are having physical ailments, Lord God, those that are discouraged, those that might have depression, Lord, and anxiety, Lord, we cast that out by your authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray for peace, peace for your people, Lord, peace over your flock. Lord, right now, would you rest upon them and bring them peace that only you can give. Lord God, give us joy that only you can give, that fills us up from our toes to the top of our head, Lord. And we know that you are God and true and you are with us and that you are calling us home, Lord. Give us that joy, that happiness, that peace, Lord God. May we be content in every circumstance by the joy of the Lord. May we be content in the salvation that you have brought us, Lord. But we do pray for healing for those that are struggling, Lord. Lord God, and those who cannot be with us, we pray that you would rest over them. Lord God, we pray for our leaders right now in the nation. That you would guide them, Lord, in justice and in mercy and in compassion, Lord, but by your will. Lord God, we pray for those who are in harm's way, Lord, our nurses, our first responders, Lord, and continuously our military, Lord Jesus. We pray for their families, that you would comfort them. Lord God, we pray that you would restore us as a nation. You would cause us to be repentant. And that you would cause all the hearts, Lord, of those who speak about you to speak truth about who you are, Lord, and what you ask of us. Lord God, we pray for this church and the elders here, that you would allow them to work wisely, Lord, and with justice and with compassion, and that their words and their thoughts and their insights would be yours, Lord Jesus. We love you and we praise you for your salvation that you've given us. And thank you for the prayer that you gave us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning again, church. My name is Pastor Luke. If there's anyone joining us or can hear us, um, or even online, we warmly welcome you. And thank you for being here and thank you for being with us in worship. I hope you are well. Um, I hope that uh, no sickness has found you. Um, We're almost there. Bear with us, we'll keep going. But like I said earlier, I believe that God is doing something special. God's doing a new and powerful thing amongst us. Not only church locally, but the Big C Church. Um, I can't tell you how many stories I've been able to hear of different churches and organizations that are able to minister in this time like they've never been able to. I mean, people are watching. The world is watching. They're watching to see how we react, how the world world goes. And so therefore, let's give them something to watch. Let's give them something to look at and let that be Christ and his bright shining light. Of course, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and I hope that you have been enjoying this as much as I have. The Lord has been speaking to me in powerful ways um, through reading this word. So I hope that this morning you don't hear any of my words or Luke 
or anything about me, but that you hear directly from God the Father through the Holy Spirit um, as we read these scriptures this morning. So we're in Mark chapter 3, verse 20 and 34. So last time we actually had the uh, verse 20 and 21 Uh, in part of the passage, but I included it again this time because it fits better with with this story. So you're getting a double dose of uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 21. So if you're turning there, um, if you have your Bibles or you have the the bulletin, Mark chapter 3, 20 through 34, and I'm reading from the uh, NIV. Hear the word of the Lord. If you can, raise a hand for God's good revelation. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, that is the scribes, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables and word pictures. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside, looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers? Jesus asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. The word of the Lord. So we've been hearing this term a lot lately. Um, It's new to me, but it's an exciting phrase. It's called social distancing. We're all familiar with this term in 2020. It's become a household term. We are social distancing at this very moment today as we do drive in church. We are distancing ourselves from one another to protect one another from a virus. There are times in our life that distancing ourselves from people, places, events, or actions is a good thing. Well, today I want to talk to you, and as you might see in the scripture, when distancing ourselves becomes a bad thing. It is not good to distance yourself, for example, from love, from emotion all the time, from concern for others, or connection. How odd is it that here we are today, or ironic, I guess, that we are practicing social distancing, yet coming together in worship. We are distancing, but knowing we need to be together. We know that distancing ourselves from community is a bad thing. We are communal creatures created for fellowship. The first bad thing about creation was that Adam was alone. In fact, I think isolation can be the best tool of the evil one, of the devil, when we're isolated. In isolation, we lose accountability. We lose discipleship. We lose a frame of reference. We lose love. In Mark chapter 3, we see several examples of bad social distancing. Here we read of attempts to distance ourselves or from others who wanted to distance themselves from Jesus Christ. Love in the flesh. So I tell you this, one of the quickest ways you can distance yourself from someone is to call them crazy. Label a person as an extremist, insane, 
a nut, maniac, freak, fanatic, whatever you want to say. We see this happen daily in the public square. Certain labels can dissolve a person of their reputation in seconds. You see it all the time. Call them a bigot, call them a racist, call them a sexist, call them Republican, call them a Democrat, call them partisan, call them dogmatic, call them a chauvinist, etc. on and on. You can think of these labels. We call these, this method labeling someone, distancing ourselves from someone. We use a loaded word to create distance between yourself and said person. The more loaded the word, the greater the distance. You see this all the time. I am distancing myself from this person who is a bigot. You know, and we, and that word, oh no, you don't wanna be a bigot, right? That's a bad thing to be. So therefore that word is loaded and you can, if you, you can just throw it at people like a bomb. We do this with all kinds of different words. That person is stupid. You know, these are, these, are, these are cruel ways of treating other human beings, but we love to do it. And it's quick and it's easy and it's effective for many people. Words matter. Labels matter. And they're dangerous. Human beings love to compartmentalize everything. It is easy to say, ah, this person holds a view I do not like or understand. Therefore, they must be crazy. Surely you've done this. I know I've done this. It's a sin. This kind of response is frankly cheap and lazy. Why? Because it requires zero self-reflection, zero education, zero dialogue, or even better yet, zero listening. Some of the greatest tragedies in human history were due, were due to verbal distancing, social distancing. For example, in the 16th and 17th centuries, the native peoples of America were called savages. What a loaded word. Settlers from Europe were able to quickly justify all kinds of crimes by merely changing the way we think about other human beings. Not everybody did this, but people were able to do this. And it's happened throughout time, throughout history, in a variety of different locations, by using words, by publishing words. That person is very different than me. We say it's because they are a savage. Nations across the ocean or across the plain or wherever it may be could literally and mentally distance themselves from any tragedy or any crime done to that native person or that person they don't understand by merely using words. Words matter. Labels matter. Some people are indeed, okay, I don't want to not say this, some people are indeed out of their minds. Crazy. Some individuals have earned the right to be called insane, nuts, or savage by their shown behavior. Yet, just like any diagnosis, we must look for clear pieces of evidence, trial by jury, or careful study by experts in the field. For example, if I, a pastor with zero medical experience, started diagnosing random people with all kinds of illnesses or diseases or conditions, it would be said, Luke is out of his mind. Where does he get the right? Misdiagnosing a person is a grave issue. Such an error can have lifetime effects on a person and the people around them. You've probably seen this with others. They've been misdiagnosed with the wrong. Someone who might be said to have, have cancer or some issue and they did not and they were given chemo or something. It completely can affect and alter their life. It can affect those around them. Misdiagnosing is a big issue and that's why we give it, we give diagnosis only to those who have done careful research, have received a degree and have the ability to do so. Therefore, if someone is to say that person, you know, use a loaded word, Point it at somebody, you can really cause problem if you're not correct, if you don't have facts. Now, most people can look at a careless, inexperienced pedestrian like myself and overlook it. The real crime comes into play when an expert or a doctor misdiagnoses a patient. It happens. We're all uh, doctors are fallible, but when it but when it happens in a way that is done, uh, that can cause issues or is done without looking at the, the facts or with the research, it's a crime. This kind of attitude and malpractice was on full display in Mark chapter three. Not only the religious scribes, 
but also by the direct family of Jesus, and then later on, many times, by the disciples. Jesus gives a firm warning that distancing ourselves from him, whether it be words, physically, in any way, usually it's been, as we see here, it's done with words, results in hopelessness, results in a lack of understanding, results in death. Jesus is the only hope we have. First, I want to show how the family of Jesus distanced themselves from Jesus. Jesus, obviously, we know, was causing a great stir in a short period. Again, Mark tells us about the crowds of people flocking to him. Jesus was known for his new teachings and his miracles. In the past two weeks, we looked at some of the common conceptions about a new rabbi like Jesus. It is possible that Jesus' family assumed he would look more like a traditional teacher or a traditional rabbi and talk more about restoring the kingdom and removing the Romans. Maybe he'd look more like the traditional messianic figure. Seemingly, Jesus' family knew that he was more than a rabbi. We know this in some level, at least his mother Mary did, but they were beginning to be annoyed. Were they annoyed at his teachings? Were they annoyed at the crowds? Were they annoyed at the miracles? Maybe the fighting with the Pharisees or the fact that Jesus just called 12 random Joes to be his disciples. Like, oh my, why'd you, why'd you have to do that? Jesus, you missed a perfectly good example. You a perfectly good opportunity to have uh, more prestigious people in your group. Maybe they were upset about that. There was probably a mixture of factors that led to the statement, he is out of his mind. As if to say, okay, Jesus, this game has gone far enough. Quit pushing it. Act a little bit more normal. We get you're the Messiah and all that, but just you're, you're kind of making things a little bit difficult for us. With this statement, Jesus' family was writing Jesus off. Essentially, what they were saying is they did not believe him to be the Son of God. Jesus was not turning out to be who they thought. His messianic ministry was not going the way they thought. Jesus is doing and saying things that make them nervous and have disrupted, that word disrupted, their lives. You can feel in these words the embarrassment. Because then it's like, okay, Jesus is in there talking. Okay, someone, you know, you ever been on, when someone's on the phone with someone who you just can't get off the phone or you're stuck in a conversation and you can't seem to get out of that conversation and maybe your friend is nearby and your friend, you know, comes in with, hey, there's a call for you or hey, don't forget that thing you were supposed to do when there was no thing and they rescue you from the situation. Well, they felt like they had to do that for Jesus in some way and not actually for Jesus. It kind of appears in the scripture that they felt like they had to rescue the Pharisees. <laughs> from Jesus. It seemed like they had to rescue the people around from Jesus because he was preaching some hard stuff. He was just talking about grieving the Holy Spirit. So his family runs in because they were seeing that things were getting a little bit annoying and disruptive and they felt the need to step in front. He was not fitting into the cultural norms. Now the scribes the scribes, who were not necessarily the Pharisees, these were the teachers of the law. They were a little bit more uh, like the, uh, the academic folk of the day. They were coming in the town to address Jesus. And you could hear them saying, Jesus, his family saying, this, Jesus, we did not sign up for this part of the experiment. Therefore, what happens? What happens? They distance themselves from Jesus. You can almost see the press conference. Imagine all the news cameras of Galilee, aimed at the family of Jesus of Nazareth as it runs across on the screen. They stand there holding hands with their lawyers to read a statement. We want to publicly apologize for the words of our family member, Jesus. We were unaware of his secret thoughts and true intentions. His actions in no way reflect the culture, values, or ideas of this house. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Pharisees and scribes. He has offended he is out of his mind. Please, beloved, see the truth in what went on that day. You see, you see it all the time on the news or in books, wherever you may get your news. You see a similar thing. I want to distance myself from this fanatic. How often do we treat Jesus the same way? Does this hit home? I hope it does. I hope it does. He ha has Jesus ever been too personal with you? Has he ever asked too much? 
The words of Jesus throughout history have been a stumbling block to many. His words demand everything of us. We cannot water them down. Jesus says emphatically, I am the way, the truth, the life in John 14, 6. As the disciples said in John 6, your words are life. Where else can we go? I hope the words of Jesus make you uncomfortable. They are meant to. Jesus' words are meant to make you uncomfortable in the best way possible. Jesus was not just another rabbi. Following him is not just another club to join. He is not merely a lifestyle coach or a motivational speaker. Jesus calls for us to die to self and be born again. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way. When Jesus calls a man, he says, come and die. This is the reality. Jesus always, you know, there's that, that picture of our lives as a home, your life a house. Think of your, your body, your realm of influence as a home. And Jesus says in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Therefore, when you open that door, we have presented our house in an appropriate way. But everyone has that closet that they put all their stuff in when, when people come over. Right? We all have that closet that we shove all of our junk into. We clean the rest of our house, but you've got to have somewhere to put the junk. I mean, we have it at our house with all of Nora's toys, for goodness sake. You have to put the junk somewhere. Now, Jesus comes in our house, and he immediately starts opening doors, and he starts going into the basement, and he finds that closet. as the first place he goes to, and we are offended, right? We talked about Jesus being a thermostat. He changed the temperature of the room, and this often offends us when someone goes and just starts snooping around in our house, but that's what Jesus does, and he does it so that he can help you clean it out. He does it to offend you, yes, but ultimately to give you life, to change you, to restore you. So I hope that this hits home. Even though Jesus had a biological family, they were spiritual children of sin, of the devil. Jesus asked us to do his will. Believe the one the Father has sent Follow him. Jesus offends us because he tells us what we do is evil. John 7, 7. He tells us we are in sin and need remade. We need to be cleansed. We need to be saved. By distancing ourselves from Jesus, we lose the only hope of new life, forgiveness, and restoration. Now let's look at how the scribes distance themselves from Jesus. As we said, the scribes were the university professors of the day. They were different than the Pharisees in that they wrote down the laws, they kept legal documents in order, and so on. They would have been very highly regarded in their understanding of Torah, the Mikra, the Jewish scriptures. The scribes could quote the Old Testament line and verse. They used big words. They had all the theological degrees. They had all the acumen. These were the experts. They should have a do no harm clause in their right to practice, right? If they misdiagnose someone, the people would consider it fact. The scribes must have been watching Jesus perform healings. They could not deny that Jesus had some extraordinary power, but yet they had to answer the question, how will they explain it away? How will they distance themselves? Will they go to a theological answer? We see in verse 22, they immediately launch into a defamatory offense against Jesus. They pull out some of the theological know-how and call Jesus Beelzebub. This is a seriously offensive allegation. It's kind of like today when we, when we accuse people of treason. Jesus is working for the Russians. Boom, he's done, explained away. Beelzebub derives from the name Lord of the Flies. This is a false god of the Ekronites, as we see in 2 Kings chapter 1. This is a Philistine god, formerly worshipped in Ekron, and later adopted by the Arama uh, Ebra Jewish religions as the principal leading demon. Therefore, Beelzebub is a title of utmost contempt. Beelzebub was to them and would have been understood by those around as the Lord of demons. The scribes were essentially calling Jesus the devil himself. As we see, he says, by the prince of demons, by the Lord of demons, the devil, he drives out demons. What an offensive statement. If you want to write someone off or distance yourself from them, this was the way to do it. <laughs> 
call them the devil. Jesus immediately calls out their absurd use of logic. Now, first, I want to point out, as we talked about misdiagnosing someone and distancing yourself from someone, right? So these were the scribes. These were the doctors, in a sense. And they just said, Jesus has cancer, just like that. The strongest word they could use, the quickest way they could write them off, they used it. And of course, the people are going to go, well, they said it. They know it. That must be true. So Jesus calls out their use of logic. It's absurd. Why would Satan work against himself? Ironically, Satan means deceiver. Therefore, why would the deceiver deceive himself? What, does, what good does this possibly do? Jesus uses the analogy to emphasize this point of a house. He says, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Verse 27. Jesus has come down into the flesh, in the incarnation, into the dominion of the strong man's house. Jesus is working directly against Satan. Remember last time we talked about you will drive out demons? He was telling his disciples, you will do what I have done. Jesus then is saying he has tied up Satan, casting out demons, showing authority, and taking back what is his. He's plundering Satan's house. Remember, Jesus is not a wimp. He's the stronger man. The truth is that because of the sin of Adam, we were born in Satan's house. We were born in sin. But when Jesus comes into our life, there is never a reason for someone to be any longer in Satan's house. Jesus has plundered all of Satan's spoils, all of sin's spoils. Jesus goes on to comment on a serious error and sin the scribes are flirting with. They were not only distancing themselves from Jesus, but they were distancing themselves from the Spirit of God. The scribes declared that Jesus was under the influence of a demonic spirit. Say what you will, Jesus says, about the Son of Man. But when you attribute the power of the Spirit to the power of the devil, you grieve the Spirit and therefore blasphemy, lie about the only saving power we have. The only saving power we have. We understand what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is by first understanding what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. Regarding the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when he has come, the Spirit will do what? He will convict the world of their sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, John 16, 8. And he will testify about me. John 15, 26, by attributing the Spirit's work to the work of Satan, you are denying the only saving hope you have. You cannot be made aware of your sin and therefore responsive to the call of Christ unless the Spirit has first touched your life. Remember we talked about the Spirit's the one that calls. Last week we said that the Spirit is the one that calls. Therefore, if you, if you have denied the Spirit, if you've grieved the Spirit, you'll never be aware of your sin. And therefore, you'll never repent. And therefore, you'll forever be lost. To push away the Spirit is an eternal grave sin. We cannot be made aware of our sin. We're about responsive to the call of Christ unless the Spirit has first touched us. Therefore, you cannot be forgiven outside the Spirit's work. Why? Because you will never ask to be forgiven. Without the Spirit, you will never be aware of your sin. You'll never be aware of who Jesus truly is. He'll always be that radical rabbi. The scribes were close to permanently distancing themselves from Jesus by cutting the only hope they had out of the equation. Henry Ironside says this, these words were never intended to torment anxious souls honestly desiring to know Christ, but they stand out as a blazing beacon, warning of the danger of persistently rejecting the Spirit's testimony of Christ until the seared conscience no longer responds to the gospel message. Therefore, beloved, if you are truly in Christ, do not be worried about committing this sin as a believer. The fact that you worry at all is proof that you will not 
and will never commit such a crime against God. Your worry and conscience is a sign of the spirit of work in you. Your awareness of sin at all is a sign of the spirit's work in you, making you aware of sin and your need to repent. Even though the scribes had greatly insulted Jesus, he still had love for them to warn them about their actions. We do not know if they continued to harden their hearts or not. Therefore, beloved, in conclusion, the beautiful irony of this story is Jesus has come into the flesh to close this distance. The distance we long to create from him, whether it be in our words, whether it be in our theology or in our action. Sin is the, is the thing that has distanced us from God. The gospel is the truth that Jesus, therefore, has closed that gap. That's the truth of it. Remember as when Jesus and the rich man, there's this cat. Jesus says that there's this chasm that has been brought between us, this great distance. Well, Jesus has come down. He has crossed that divide. He has made a way. In John chapter three, Jesus declares that without believing him and before he came into the world, we stood condemned already. And those of you that do not know Jesus, you already stand condemned. All of us are distanced from God, a part of the spoils of sin's house. Apart from God, the saving work of Christ. We need Christ to be a part of that saving work. How frightened to know that we push away our only rescuer. Even Jesus' disciples distanced themselves from Jesus when he went to the cross. Peter followed Jesus, it says, just closely enough, but at a distance. Matthew 26, 58. Peter followed Christ as he was being taken away, but at a distance. Just far enough behind to not be considered with Jesus. He loved Jesus, but he kept his distance. Does this hit home? Do any of you love Jesus, but to a certain extent? Is there anything that can happen in life that could cause you to go, whoa, 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 Jesus, that's a little bit too far. I'll follow you, but not that far. We're talking about death, being shut down. I don't know, being shamed by my friends, having my kids not like me. What are we talking about here, Jesus? Have you truly counted the cost? Or do you just want to keep your distance? Do you want to follow Jesus as long as it's convenient? I know I've been that way many times in my life. Well, this is convenient. Following Jesus is rather easy. It's rather comfortable. It's rather convenient. But that's not what Jesus is asking of us. He's asking of us to follow him, to listen to his will, and to not be afraid of wherever that may lead. Yet, even as we said these things, even as Peter followed behind and Peter didn't want to die because of that love, not yet anyway, Jesus carried on and died for us, as Ephesians 2.13 states. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. This is the process of discipleship. It's getting close to Jesus, coming near to Jesus, closing the distance where we become more and more willing to identify and to be identified with Jesus and his agenda over our own agenda. This is why Jesus said we must love him over everything, even our own life, Luke 14, 26. We have the spirit of God, beloved, to help us. We have an advocate. We are not alone. This is an extraordinary claim. And it's a claim that caused many people to distance themselves or to walk away from. How, therefore, will you and how will we answer this Jesus of Nazareth? Will you dismiss him as a fanatic? Will you dismiss him as insane? Will you dismiss him as the devil? I agree with what C.S. Lewis said when he made the argument this way. We only have three options when it comes to Jesus. First, if he claims to be God, which he did, and yet, in fact, is not, he has to be a madman or a lunatic, right? As his family said, he's out of his mind. 
Second, if he's neither God or a lunatic, he must be a liar, deceiving others by his lie, right? The father of lies, Beelzebub. Third, if he is neither of these, he must be God. You can only choose one of these three possibilities. If you do not believe that he is God, you have to consider him a madman. If you cannot take him for either of the two, you have to take him for being a liar. There is no need for us to prove if Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. All we have to do is find out if he's a lunatic or a liar. If he's neither, he must be the son of God. And you notice that the Pharisees and his family knew they couldn't just call him a good teacher. They couldn't just call him a rabbi because he was making extraordinary claims and he would go on to make extraordinary claims. Therefore, do not write him off. Do not distance himself. Believing Jesus is a madman or a liar is a fine way to distance yourself. The claims of Jesus are astonishing. They're life-changing. They're extra ordinary. These claims will also bring you suffering by this world. They must be answered to, beloved. You must answer to this. Either we see his words as insane or lying, the word or the words of life. They're either the works of the devil or they're the words of true life. For those who have faith, who do his will, will find him. They are true children of God. Are you following closely to Jesus? I can't emphasize this question enough. Can you, can you, your children or your bank teller or your lawyer or the doctor you meet with, can they tell that you and Jesus are close? Is your light shining before them? Does your neighbor know that you and Jesus are close or do you only follow as long as it is comfortable? Do you keep your distance? Therefore, if if this is true, and I know it is, because it's true of me, repent of your attempts to distance yourself from God while it is still the day, while there's still time to be forgiven of our sins against the Son of Man. Hear the promise of Christ in John 5, 24. This is what I'll end with. Beautiful verse, and it sums up everything we've been reading today. Jesus says this, very truly, fact. Here's a fact for you. I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but he has crossed over, crossed the divide from death to life. Beloved in Jesus, the distance, it's closed. Believe, follow, repent, renew, restore. Let's pray. Jesus, Holy God, by your Holy Spirit, all we can say, Lord, is thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done by your grace. Lord Jesus, we don't want to follow at a distance. Draw us close. Lord, we know that in you and through what you have done, it's no longer us that live but you, Lord Jesus. And therefore, we are one with you in your sufferings, in your death. And in your resurrection, Lord God, I pray that this word would penetrate, Lord, the minds and hearts of this people and that it would grow and blossom, Lord, and become true in their lives and that they would leave this place changed, following very, very closely to your love and power. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen. All right. We're going to end with a song you probably know called Mighty to Save. A beautiful reminder of our God who has closed the distance. He's gone the whole way. Sing it out loud and proud. And sing it like you mean it.
place of the Savior. The hope of nations. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. So take me as you find me To all my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in And now I surrender I surrender Receive the benediction. Go in the power and in the might of Jesus Christ, the one who conquered the grave, the one who has closed the distance, the one who has made a way, knowing and believing his authority and his power. Draw closely, beloved, to him, the one who can save, the only name under heaven and in earth that has the power. Jesus Christ forevermore. Go in his name. Amen.
Okay, but I'll throw mine in the 